Good morning, everyone. It is great to see you out on this kind of chilly, cold morning. Do me a favor, stand up for a second. We're going to do things in a little bit of a different order this morning. So as the band plays for a few minutes, uh, take a couple of minutes and um, go around and meet and greet each other.
Well, the Lord God will be with us wherever we go. And uh, this morning, we have somebody who's going. And I wanted to uh, recognize Sarah Spencer. Sarah, can you come up for a minute? I warned her that I was going to put her on the spot this morning. And uh, three points in a poem, right? <laughs> We're going to have a sermon this morning, Sarah? No. I just wanted to, uh, to recognize Sarah, and we're going to be doing that a little bit more this year, doing some ministry spotlights and kind of highlighting some of the things that are happening in our church. And um, I'm very excited for Sarah and uh, for what she's doing. Um, I'll let her share just briefly. Um, she's getting ready to head back to Liberty University and kind of share maybe why she's doing that. You know, why, why is she going in that direction and kind of just real briefly where, where your heart is? All right, thanks. Um, <clears throat> well, like Doug said, my name is Sarah, um, and I just really, really love Jesus. Um, I'm excited to serve him, and um, that's just what I want to do with the rest of my life. I want to serve um, the person that created me and the person that died for my salvation. Um, I go to Liberty University, and my major is teaching English as a second language, and my minor is religious global studies. I really want to um, use these degrees so I can be a missionary and um, serve God full-time overseas um, to countries where people um, have never heard about Christianity before. Um, I went to a mission trip to Malaysia, and talking to some of those people, um, some of them never even heard the name Jesus Christ, and some of them told me that um, they just heard it was a guy that people threw rocks at. And that sort of, that broke my heart. And I just really want to um, teach people about Jesus Christ. And going to Liberty University, I've grown a lot um, in my walk with him. And I just know that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And um, something exciting that's happening this year is I get to lead a missions trip to the Philippines. So um, if any of you want to talk to me about that, um, I'd be more um, then happy to answer questions, and we do need support, so um, I can tell you about that and um, let you know what's happening with my Philippine trip. Cool. Well, awesome, Sarah. Thank you. Now, Sarah has been back and um, um, headed back this week, I guess on Wednesday, uh, to Liberty, and um, I just have very much appreciated uh, what she has been doing and, and have just seen in such a, a visible way uh her growth and, and, you know, in her spiritual journey. And uh, so let's have a word of prayer. Let's kind of pray for Sarah as she heads back to school, and, and let's uh, pray for the Lord just to bless us as we have our time together this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for your blessings. Um, we do love you, and that's why we're here, and that's, that's what we're about. We love you. We recognize because you first loved us and showed us what that looked like. Um, Lord, we just want to lift up Sarah. Um, just pray that you would just bless her ministries, just provide for those opportunities um, you know, that are before her. Um, God, just give her wisdom um, to, to know what paths to take, God, as she endeavors to, to give her life just to serve you. Um, or give her safe travel as she heads to school and gets settled in. Just pray, God, that you'd meet those needs that, 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 that are going to be there. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you'd bless our time this morning as we just worship you because that's what this is. Um, it's, 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 it's us from our hearts just, just trying to say thank you um, for all that you, you do in our lives. And, and Lord, I just pray now that as we worship you through our giving, God, that you would just bless that. Um, we, just, we do love you in Jesus' name. Amen.
God I can put on a stand or a God I hold in the palm of my hand. I have a God that's holding me. And I don't have a God that I can create in the place I live with the money I make. I have a God. He made everything. So I don't This time we'll dismiss our children for Children's Church. And, uh, well, proud of you for coming out and uh, braving the threat of weather. All right? So, <laughs> who knows what's going to happen. Let me go ahead and just kind of bring you up to speed. Uh, I do have this in the bulletin. I want to make sure everybody's aware. Um, the, the, there are, in rare instances, if we get severe weather, we, we will cancel our services. And the way we notify you about that um, is we put that on C Notify, which C Notify is a system that basically allows us to have a recorded message that goes out to everybody on the system, and um, it happens pretty much all at the same time, so everybody gets the message. 
um, to as far as events that are going on. We use that for announcements for the church or just reminders periodically. Um, this would be a, a classic example. If we get the weather that is expected this afternoon, you might be getting a, see, a notification um, this afternoon about services tonight. If you are not on that list, if you don't receive phone calls, please see either me or Bryant, and we will make sure to get you added to that. If you are on that list and don't want to be on the list, please see me or Bryant, and Bryant or I, or, or me, and I will, uh, we will make sure that we get you taken off of that list as well. It's kind of funny because at first I was like, hey, this is Pastor Doug, and people, you know, they try to talk to me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I don't know that, but I, you guys have told me that. So, but that is one of the ways we communicate here at the church. Um, also, um, WCPO, if we get enough notice, um, WCPO Channel 9 will also utilize that uh, for, for closings as well. So, again, just want to make sure that everybody's aware of that. Um, I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew 16. Matthew chapter 16. Um, I'm springboarding this morning off of something that Robert did last night at Youth Church. Uh, Robert uh, spoke at Youth Church last night. And if we don't get snowed out, Robert will be speaking tonight at, uh, at our Sunday evening service. He's got a break between his classes, and we'll be actually sharing some things tonight. Um, and uh, I appreciate that. We're going to be highlighting some different people in the church, as I said, and Robert will be one of those a- as well. Um, but in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13, uh, as Robert was kind of talking about judging and gossiping last night, some two things that, that some, we may need to hear about from time to time. Um, he, he was reading through this, and he stopped, but I did what you usually do when I'm speaking, and I read on, you know. And I, I was reading on, and it just really kind of got my attention last night. And I thought, you know, I, I want to talk about that this morning because it's so relevant. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Let's just read this account. It says, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea, uh, Caesarea Philippi, He asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And uh, so they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. All right, so as we were reading this, and as he was explaining this last night, what an amazing story. As Jesus uh, is, is with his disciples, and God for the first time reveals to Peter who exactly Jesus Christ is. He's not just a prophet. He's not just another guy. He is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And so Peter right now, as, as Robert was explaining last night, Peter has is, is got to be feeling pretty good about himself, right? I mean, Peter is just, he's a, he's a guy just like you and just like I am. And as, as Peter is, is expressing, who do you think that I am, Peter? Man, that's putting you on the spot. It's like being in class and the teacher says, okay, Mike, what's the answer? You know, and, and, and you're there and everybody's looking at you. And are you going to say the right thing? You're going to be embarrassed. And he nails it. He absolutely nails it as God reveals who he is. So Peter has got to be right now walking on cloud nine. And then Jesus goes on to say this. He says, you're Peter, and upon this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Peter is going from this mindset of, wow, I'm a hero. I've just done it right. I just did all this stuff, all right? And then you go on in verse 21, and it's amazing to see what happens. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, that this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. 
you are an offense to me, for you're not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. What in the world just happened? <laughs> right? I mean, Peter on the one hand, awesome job, Peter. I am the Christ. God must have revealed this to you. Good job, Peter, to Satan, get behind me. What in the world happened here and what's going on? Because I think this is pretty cool as, as we begin to see what's happening. First of all, in verse 21, let's just kind of look through it and see. It says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and be raised on the third day. So he mentions three groups of people. The elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. As he mentioned these three groups of people, there were, were basically, basically the elders were respected people in their community. Chief priests were typically Sadducees. And Pharisees were, were of course, the religious rulers of their day. And as, as these, 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 I'm sorry, the chief priests were typically Sadducees and the scribes were typically Pharisees. All right, so as, as we go through and look at that. These three groups of people comprised a group known as the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin Council are the group of people, the men that Jesus has brought before when he's drunk from the Garden of Gethsemane, when he's praying his prayer, Father, if there's any other way, he's drunk from the Garden, he's taken and he's cast before this Sanhedrin Council. They are like the judicial system for the children of Israel. They are like the high court for the children of Israel. They are the ones who made the decision ultimately to have Jesus Christ crucified, right? So all of this stuff with the crucifixion that's going to take place, Jesus knew this wasn't a surprise to him. We know that. It wasn't the world going out of control. It was God's plan for what was going to happen. Because God sent Jesus for a purpose. And the purpose was to come to die for our sins. Right? To die for our sins so we would not have to. To die for our sins so that we can in turn have a relationship restored with God. To die for our sins so that one day we could die and spend an eternity in heaven with God. Apart from the crucifixion of Christ, none of those things happen. Right? So Peter, as, as, as he makes this pronouncement, you're the Christ. You are the Messiah. And Jesus says, good job, Peter, good job. Then Jesus begins to explain why he's really here. And Peter hears Jesus say these words that, that Jesus is going to be killed. And what's, what's, what's Peter's response? Probably what your response would be and what my response would be. Not on my watch. It's not happening on my watch. Not, not, when I'm, not if I have anything to do with it. But Jesus, you are the Son of God. You've just told us that you are the Messiah. You are, you are God in the flesh. There's no way you should let this happen to you. There's no way you should let this happen to you. And Jesus looks at Peter, and I'm sure he knows Peter's heart, because Peter is concerned about Jesus. And Peter sees Jesus getting ready to go through something that is very, very difficult. And what Peter wants to do is say, you've got this really hard thing that's in front of you. Let's see if we can't find another way to get you around this difficult task that's, that's been presented to you by God. Now let's think about that again. Peter said, I see what you have in front of you, and there's nothing easy about it. There's got to be another way around this hard stuff that God is asking you to do. And Jesus immediately becomes angry. And he immediately becomes angry to the point that he looks at Peter, and as Peter is rebuking Jesus, with, with the best of intentions probably, he turns and says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. For you're not mindful of the things of God, 
but of the things of men. Why? Why would Peter, why would Jesus say that to Peter? Satan literally means adversary. And I think that to, to put this in perspective, you've got to go back and realize some things that Jesus had experienced. In fact, let's go back and let's read Matthew chapter 4, uh, Luke chapter 4, rather, and see what, maybe if we could get a clue of what was on Jesus' mind right here. Luke chapter 4 and verse 1. Jesus It says, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And being tempted for 40 days by the devil, and in those days he ate nothing. And after when it, they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give to you in their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only you shall serve. Then He brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, row yourself down from here. For it is written, He shall give His angels charge over you to keep you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him, what? Until an opportune time. You think about that. When Satan was tempting Jesus at this most vulnerable time as he's, he's hungry and he's tired and he's just, he leaves after that temptation. But he doesn't stop. You know, that's the way Satan works. You know, he, he knows when we're at our weakest. He knows when we're, we're, we're struggle, we're at our most point to struggle. And he, he never quite really goes away. He just waits for a more opportune time. And as, as you look at what's happening in Matthew chapter 16, let's go back and look at this. If you really want to follow what's going on here, Satan is looking at Jesus, and he's seeing Jesus for the first time begin to explain to his disciples the reason why he came, and he's trying one more time to tempt Jesus to find another way. No, no, Peter says up and says, no, Jesus, no. They can't kill you. No, Jesus, no. You shouldn't have to go through this really hard thing in your life. No, Jesus, no. The problem was this. It was God's plan, and it was necessary for Jesus to experience the crucifixion that he was going to experience. Or we would have never seen the advantages of the crucifixion, which is what? The power over death, salvation, a changed life. The, the bottom line is, God knew and Jesus knew that in order for me to get from here to all of these things over here that will matter forever, I've got to go through this. And Peter looked and he tried to tell Jesus to make it easier. He tried to tell Jesus to, to not do what God wanted for his life. 
because it just sounded too hard. Let me say that again. What's going on here in the problem that Jesus has with Peter is that Peter is looking at the sufferings that Jesus is going to experience. And he loves Jesus so much that he doesn't want Jesus to be hurt and experience that, that ordeal. But in reality, the long-term consequences of not going through that were so much worse. You see, Peter was looking at things from a very short-term perspective. I got to say, as I was reading this last night, and I just was reading this, I, I could relate to Peter a whole lot more than I wanted to. Now, I wish I could stand up and say that, yeah, what was Peter thinking? But I can say this as a pastor. There have been a lot of times where people have come to me or we'll sit here on a Sunday night or a Sunday morning and we'll take prayer requests. And, and I'll hear something very difficult going on in somebody's life. And I look at that situation. I look at that circumstance and I think, you know, we've got to find a way around this. God, you need, you need to remove this circumstance from their life. God, I don't want them to experience what they're, what they're experiencing right now. I don't want them to go through the hurt. I don't want them to go through the, the, the insecurity. I don't want them to go through the things that they're getting ready to go through. But the reality is this. Is that sometimes, in order to get from here to here, you got to go through this. And, and Jesus rebukes, rebukes Peter. And it's kind of interesting because some of the early church fathers, when he says, get, get thee behind me, get behind me. He's basically not saying, go away, which is what, what he told Satan when he was in the wilderness. He's basically saying, get back behind me where you should be and follow me. Follow me, because where I'm going, you're going to be going too. And we know that in Peter's life that he does walk that same similar path as Jesus as he comes to the end of his life, and Peter is also crucified for the cause of Christ. Peter, in his love, and, and this is a hard thing to hear, but Peter in his love for Jesus was trying to, to, to help Jesus to avoid what needed to happen in his life. Peter was not trusting that God was in control of the circumstance and knew what was best. Now this is an easy thing to read about when it comes to Peter. And this is an easy thing to read about when it comes to Jesus. It's not an easy passage to read when it comes to me or you. There are some things in our lives that we don't understand why they happen. There are some things in our lives that, that are hard. And we pray, and we pray, God, you know, um, we want you to uh, remove this from our life. But maybe God doesn't answer that prayer because it's not really what they need. Now, he's, he's going to make a statement here in verse 24. He says, Jesus turns around and says to his disciples, as he is explaining this, he says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I want to tell you something. That, that phrase to us looks completely different than it did to them. 
we see the cross. I mean, if I look around, I bet there are people wearing crosses right now in our church. I think that's cool, you know, that, that reminder of the crucifixion and what Jesus did for us, God's love for us. Right? But the cross back then was, was different. They didn't wear it around their necks. They didn't talk about it. Even the Romans didn't even talk about the cross or crucifixions in polite company. Because they were horrible. A crucifixion was one of the most horrible things you could possibly imagine. And it was something that you didn't discuss or talk about. And so when, when Jesus turns to his disciples, it says, I want you to take up your cross and follow me. They're not thinking about this little thing that you wear around your neck or the earrings or the you know, whatever that we have, they're thinking about this thing that should not be mentioned in public, in polite company. They're thinking about, but if I pick up this cross, I know what happens when I throw it on my shoulder and I begin to walk. You don't carry a cross for no reason. You carry a cross, and there's going to be some consequence to that that's probably not going to be good. But what Jesus is telling his disciples and what he's telling us is that sometimes, while it's hard for us to understand and we may not even understand why, sometimes it's necessary for us to do like Jesus did and trust God that it's the best thing and that it's what's needed in our lives for us to pick up our cross and to follow him. To pick up our cross means I trust God that this circumstance while I may not understand why I'm going through it, I trust you, God, that there's a purpose and a reason that will have eternal consequences in my life. You couldn't watch what Jesus went through on the cross at the time and imagine that anything good would come from it. So what he's telling his disciples is this. If you desire to come after me, you have to deny yourself. He said, I'm, I'm asking for a willingness in an extreme disciple of Christ to say, I trust you, God, and actually mean it. It's easy to say, I trust you, God, when things are going well. But he's saying, I want you to say, I trust you, God, even when you realize that this may get really hard for me. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Did Jesus, did Jesus experience that? What did Jesus pray in the garden? They're getting ready to take him away to be crucified. He's praying in the garden. What's he praying? Father, if there's any other way, but not my will, but yours be done. Wake up the disciples. Come back, pray again. Father, if there's any other way, not your will, but mine be done. Wake up the disciples. Go back, pray again. Father, if there's any other way. What's he doing? He's denying himself. When we think about Jesus, we think about him being God. We don't think about his humanity sometimes. He was like us. The thought of doing this was appalling to him. But he trusted God. God, if there's another way. Now you remember, it's kind of crazy. Back in Matthew 16, he rebukes Peter for trying to find another way. But he's sees this temptation. I think once again he's being tempted. If anyone desires to come after me, let him take up, deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Verse 25, why? For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. There are times where 
we need to tell people to do the hard thing even if it costs them. Because sometimes our efforts to save our lives actually cost our lives. He says, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for a soul? You know, as, as you think about this, I'm just reminded of, of a story that we've, we've told before. And um, um, there's a movie made, The End of the Spear, that after this, this guy, Jim Elliott. He was a missionary who was very pro- had a very promising future. And he, and he ge- varied from a very wealthy family. And he gives it all up to be a missionary, to go to do what Sarah wants to do, you know, and to go to a people who have never heard about Christ. And they were not only had never heard about Christ, they were very hostile towards foreign people and toward anybody who wasn't in their tribe. And he's trying to explain why he would do something like that. Why give up the future that I could have? Because he had wealth, he could have had a nice house, he could have had a good job, he had all of this potential in his life. And he's trying to explain it to people, and he basically said this, he is no fool to give what he can't keep in order to gain what he can't lose. Think about that. He is no fool to gain what he can't keep It's, we sometimes have just a wrong perspective of life. And what, as he's reading this phrase, and I'm reading this passage of Scripture, and I, and I see what's going on with Peter. Peter had good intentions, but Peter didn't understand that sometimes God's will involves hard things for your life. It's not because God doesn't love you. It's because He does. And sometimes hard things happen for a reason. And you may not understand them all right now. But He's saying, do like I do, Peter. And if you have a cross that God asks you to pick up, then pick it up and just trust Him that there's a reason. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for a soul? Let me ask you this. What Your soul is who you are. Your soul is who you are. Sometimes we're afraid to make a commitment to Christ because we're afraid of what will cost us. And and what do we do in that instance? We think we're saving our life. But in reality, we're throwing it away for eternity. What God is always looking for in your life is not how you're going to feel about it today or how you're going to feel about it tomorrow. He's looking at how you're going to feel about it a hundred years from now and for the rest of, for the rest of your life. Sometimes hard things happen. Sometimes, to be honest, Christianity is counterintuitive. Who in their right mind would pick up a cross and carry it? Who in their right mind would do that? But what Jesus is saying is, I want you to look beyond what your understanding is and trust that if this is God's plan for your life, 
you have to trust him. There's a reason. And you can always know that God is looking out for your best interest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for this time in your word. Um, it's, it's hard for us to grasp this because we don't want to. Being your child is the most amazing thing. Um, it's, there's just so much that comes with it. Uh, to know that you're always there, to know that uh, there's purpose and meaning in our life, to know that all this stuff that we work so hard for and we strive for, we, we realize later in life that we can't take it with us. You, you help us to kind of put all this in perspective. And you're looking at not what's best for Maybe right now, you're looking at what's best for our soul for eternity. I just pray, God, if there's anyone here who has not really given much thought to Christianity because um, they're afraid of the cost, I just pray you'd help them to realize that the cost of hanging on to their life is much greater than the cost of losing it for you. And, and God, you know, whenever I say losing it for you, I, I mean surrendering to you to trust you that that you you love us and that you're looking out for our best interest and that you will not allow anything in our lives that that you cannot bring something good from God if there's somebody in here uh, this morning who's who are going through maybe some of these things you're carrying your cross right now and you're praying God if there's any other way just pray that you'd help us as we're praying, if there's any other way, to add the next part of the prayer. But not my will, but yours be done. It's tough to pray. Thank you for the example. Help us to trust you, God. It's amazing to live our lives knowing that you are in control and that we can trust that anything you bring in our lives, allow to come is ultimately for our benefit. Um, help us to take up our cross, have that willingness and to follow you. In Jesus' name. I'd like to invite you to just stand, just in an attitude of prayer. Yeah, I mean, I know, I know that this morning wasn't a, uh, a feel-good message. The reality is, is that God never promised that you would always feel good. But He promises so much more. You just got to learn to trust. If you're here this morning and you've never accepted Christ, I know this may have sounded kind of strange this morning. Because how can the thought of losing your life ever be a positive thing? When I say losing your life, I'm not necessarily meaning being killed. I'm, I'm meaning giving up your life to live it the way God wants you to live it. How can that be a positive thing? I'm telling you, when you, when you do it and you experience it like, like so many have done throughout history, like these guys, these disciples, they were just regular guys. It changed something in them, the point that, that everybody noticed It's, it's the most amazing thing you can experience. But you will never understand what Christianity is until you're willing to trust God and take that step. This morning, this time is for you. If, if you think you might want to take that chance and, and say, God, I, I, I'm, I'm going to take, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you with my life. Watch and see what he does. If you're struggling this morning, you know, rest assured that, that God is doing something in your life. And it, it may hurt right now, but God knows, and there's a reason. Take up your cross and follow him and watch and see what happens on the other side. As the music plays, I just invite you to spend some time with the Lord or come and pray or come and let somebody show you from God's Word how you can know Christ.
this morning is, is, this time is for you. Father, Lord, we just want to thank you um, for your word. I'm really thankful that it doesn't just tell me what I want to hear. And I'm so often tempted to do that you know, when people come and you know that you can tell them one thing and that's going to be real easy. If you tell them something else, it's going to be really hard. But they need to hear the hard thing. So I just pray you'd help us to, to be willing to hear the hard thing too and to trust. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you and be seated. Um, as far as announcements, I think I pretty much covered it all. Um, see Notify. If you've not been added to that list, make sure that you uh, see, uh, see me or see Bryant. We'll make sure we get you added. Uh, check you know, check your, uh, your phones for voicemails regarding any changes regarding services tonight or next week or in the future. Um, it is the beginning of the year, and our offering envelopes are down on the front uh, pew down here. Um, offering envelopes are certainly not something that's required. Um, that is something that if you would like a statement, a contribution statement at the end of the year, um, the only way we have to keep track of that is through the envelope system. Um, so if you would like to do that, you can have the, the boxes are down here. Just write your name and number down for which box that you took, um, and then you can put your offerings in that. Um, and then there'll, there'll be a record of your contributions if, if that's something you desire to do. All right. Um, Kim? All right. So grab a wreath on the way out. Make sure it gets downstairs. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're so glad to have you here with us today. Let's be dismissed with a song. Please stand. Blessed be your name.